Good night, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we welcome you to our Wednesday night time of um, discussion study. We are going to look into a very important aspect of our human experience tonight as Christians. And we welcome all those of you. We want to ask you, those of you who have joined in, and those of you who may join in later, please share the live with somebody and so that they can connect with us and all of us can participate in this very interesting moment for the next hour or so. And um, if you have questions, we want to ask you to feel free to text your questions in or write them. And um, our moderator is going to get the questions to us and we will respond to you as the questions would come. But we're thankful for your presence. Appreciate the time that you will take to spend with us tonight. Interesting discussion. We would like to have you share with us by means of you asking questions. And so feel free to be a part of this discussion tonight. We want to look at the subject. Um, we're looking at um, the believer and his relationship. That's what we're talking about. The believer and his relationship. And we're talking about his relationship um, one to God, his relationship to his brethren, and then his relationship to um, people, every uh, um, one else that is outside of that um, uh, scope of the brethren and such. So we want to talk about that tonight. Man and his relationships, or should I say the believer, more specifically, and his relationships. And as we talk about those um, interesting things tonight, I know all of us are going to benefit. Sometimes even while we're speaking, we are learning. And while we are speaking, you also can learn, glean something from what we're going to be sharing tonight and talk about a very interesting subject. So we bless God for you. And so we begin by establishing the fact that man was designed for relationship. Man was designed for relationship. And if you look at the very um, makeup of man, and God's statement when he created man. The Bible tells us in the garden where God took the dust from the earth and he formed man and breathed into him um, the breath of life. And the Bible says that he became a living soul. And not long after, the Bible says that God looked at Adam, the first man that he created, and then he said, you know, it is not good that man should be alone. And therefore he created for him a companion, as the Bible relates to it, saying, he made a help meet. And so you would get the understanding that um, God never intended that man should exist outside of relationships. We were designed for relationships. And so therefore, uh, we want to talk about that those relationships tonight as to how we relate firstly to God, how we relate to the brethren, and how we relate to those who are not part of the church per se. And as we talk, continue our discussion talking about man and his relationship, the first aspect we want to treat with though is the fact that man and his relationship, or should I say the believer and his relationship to God. The believer and his relationship to God. Because as we do understand, it was God who formed man. God was the, uh, the, he is the designer of this human as it were. He took time to form him. When David was speaking about how God formed him, he says, you know my very intricate parts, every single thing about me. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, uh, as Jeremiah was saying, you knew me. And so God took time and he formed man and every single aspect of man's makeup is what God has placed, the ingredients that make man who he is. Uh, God, knew exact, God knows exactly what are the ingredients that he placed within this man or us as human beings. And because he knows our framework and our makeup, he knew that one of the things that we will need, we will design for relationship. And so he first established the fact that without him, we cannot really establish strong, good, strong relationships. And so the first aspect, as I said, that we want to talk about tonight is man and his relationship or the believer and his relationship to God. Um, the Bible makes the statement, 
I'm just speaking of air. The Bible makes the statement in the book of um, John, uh, chapter 15, David. It says, For as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine, he says, No more can you if you do not abide in me. What Jesus was really teaching is that the branch is uh, dependent on the vine. The source of the branch life, the branch's life, is dependent on its connection to the vine. And so without the vine, the branch cannot be sustained. And what we're saying, therefore, is that man in his relationship to God, without his connection to God, it's difficult for him or her to really be sustained in life without his connection or relationship to God. And that should be more or less the most important aspect of our relationship as human beings. That should be, uh, should I say, the, the foundation of all of our relationship. Every other relationship that we have should really flow out of our relationship to God. But we do understand, therefore, that um, a whole lot of things affect our relationships. And sometimes, though we may have a relationship with God, sometimes because of a social, social experience, how we were socialized, as, as I would say, sometimes that has influenced how we relate to people. And um, we'll talk about that tonight. Although we're connected to God and we have a relationship with Him, because of how our lives, how we were raised, the environment in which we were raised, sometimes that affects how we relate to people. But as I said, we want to talk about, firstly, our relationship to God. And the brother um, Addison, um, we're talking about man and his relationship to God. Or should I say the believer and his relationship to God? Um, tell me, um, how important do you think um, it is for a believer to have a strong, song, good relationship with God. Good evening, everyone. Well, Pastor, I think that, and I believe that is the most important thing for a believer upon the earth. His relationship with God, his relationship with Jesus Christ. If you look at God in himself, God is a God of relationship. All through scripture, the Old and New Testament, you will see that God is a God of relationship. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a team. There is a relationship that exists within them. And based on that image, he created man in his own image and likeness to have relationship with God. Now, everything that God does, he does it in unity. When there was the act of creation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all in, involved. In the act of salvation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was all involved in that act also. So we see a great unity within the God himself, a relationship within the God, within God himself. And because of that relationship, he made man to have a relationship with himself. And of course, we can go back when God placed Adam, the first man in the garden, that relationship was broken. We understand that Jesus, that God used to come down in the cool of the day and talk with Adam. Yes. You understand? And, and we see that relationship, we see God searching, God looking, and in fact when Adam fell into sin, God still come, um, came down, and he said, Adam, where are thou? Adam began to hide from God, but God still long, still came down, as it was before, to talk to that, to have relationship with Adam. So God is a God of relationship with himself, firstly, he's also a relationship with creation, yes. and man. When we speak of man, we speak about man and woman. His is his, his prime, his object of his love, his object of relationship. The way how we treat angels in heaven is creation. We know of two creation, the angels and we know of man. But we see how God treat them differently. Yes. When the angels fell into sin, God cast them away. But when man fell into sin, God came running yes. after man because of relationship. So even though when man fell into sin and broke that, that, that access to God. We see that God sent His own Son to pay the ultimate price, died on the cross so that we can come before Him one more time. The veil of the temple that separated man from God to, to pray and to intercede was torn in two. No man have access. The book of Hebrews talk about that access to come boldly before the throne of grace. 
So God is, is longing for us to have relationship. Know that we are as believers, you're asking the importance. We know we are saved, we are, we are born again. Positionally, we're in a relationship once you accept Jesus Christ. You have been forgiven of your sins and of your free access. You enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you do not stay there. And like in any other relationship that you may have with a wife, with, with a child, with a neighbor, there are certain elements, there are certain things that you must do. That is with God also. Communication. Spending time with God. Listening to the voice of God. Attending, coming to the house of God. Of course, we have the whole COVID challenge now. But there are some ingredients laid out in the scripture that we must follow to build and to establish and to grow in this relationship with God. Prayer, fasting, the word of God, feeding. The Bible says a newborn baby desires a sense of milk of the word that you may go thereby. And after you, you would have fed on milk and you begin to grow, desire the meat of the word. So there's a, there's a growth. Even Christ um, lightened the believer and the church relationship with a bride and his groom. Such is the closeness, such is the intimacy that God wants to have with his people, with the believer. Just like a, 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 a physical marriage between a man and a woman, they, they, will, they will come before the altar, enter into a covenant. We have entered into a covenant with God, a binding covenant. And just so that, that, that woman will, on, on that marriage night, and they will enter into intimacy and the blood will be shed. We have entered into intimacy, covenant, through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So God lightened our relationship in a, in a most intimate way, physically, you know, between a man and his wife. And God wants us to have relationship, to grow in relationship. We have made everything possible. Everything possible. He has given us his word. He has given us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Let me stop here and for a moment. Yes, thank you so much. Because um, I know you have a whole lot of stuff inside it that you can do share on this particular subject. And I heard you talked about what you what you give me understanding as you were speaking here. You give me a sense in which that this relationship that God is um, longing for, should I say, um, reaching out to man to have. You you give me a sense in which God really values this relationship. Um, understanding the price he was willing to pay, understanding the distance that he was willing to go to ensure that this relationship is restored. Because he could have, as you rightly said, he could have, you know, um, abandoned us as some of the angels in themselves who did not have the opportunity that we have. But he did not stay there. He, he went and allowed his only son to come and pay such a, should I say, a very big price for us so that we can have that kind of relationship with God. But as I, as I heard you speak as well too, I understand, um, I, I realize that the, the principles, there, there are some principles that governs relationships, whether it is um, a husband and wife, whether it's um, sons and, and parents, uh, whatever relationship, there are some principles that governs that relationship. And um, I heard you made mention of one of them, you talk about the value of conversation of communication how important that is i heard you talk about um the idea of spending time together um because without those important ingredients um you can have relationship and sometimes because of the lack of fellowship um, relationship is struggling because this strength of the fellowship is not really there as such um tell me as um as a believer, do you think that um, if the, the relationship that we have with God is, is, has to be strong, um, what are some of the additional things in, in your own mind that you think that needs to happen for us to have that kind of strong relationship with God, the quality of relationship that he wants us to have with him? I heard you made mention of some of them inside here. You talk about prayer. You talk about fasting. Um, as there other things that more or less you may want to highlight inside there? Um, recently in my life, what I find that is, is a critical thing that I think is really now is, is listening to the voice of God. 
listening because you're in a relationship you're communicating with God via true prayer now prayer is not just a one-way um, we have talking one way um, approach before God. We will just come and just talking, talking um, before God. And I think we need to look at our appro approach to God, our approach in prayer. Sometimes we come before God with this, as I heard some preachers talk about this grocery list give me, give me, bless me, bless me. You understand? But prayer in its original design was not about a grocery list. Oh God, bless me here. Give me a house and a car. Yes, we need all these things, and God will provide. But prayer in its original design was fellowship, As communication. You, yeah. you have spoken about God coming down and having this conversation yes. with Adam. Yeah. And you will realize, and we would um, probably deduce from that, yeah. that it was not just Adam speaking. Yes. It was God himself communicating or sharing his thoughts with Adam as well. Amen. And at that point in time, Pastor, Adam didn't need healing. He was not sick. Right. He did not need a financial breakthrough. So what was Adam and God talking about? Have you ever stopped to study? What was the conversation between God and Adam at that particular point in time? Adam didn't fall in sin yet. Before that, there was no need of breakthrough. There was no need for a house or a car. Yet it was in a garden. There was no need for healing. He was not sick. But yet, God longed for. So pray that I can draw from that as you write to say and say that prayer in its original design was just fellowship. Yes. Just come, we just being in love. We just love this person. We just talk with them. And it's important, and I'm, I'm learning that, the, the importance of listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Listen to, to God, because God speaks. And, and many a times we, we, we just go before God and just talk, 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 and we, we rush off from that, 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 that environment, from that time, and, and we think that we have prayed. When it really and truly we have not really prayed. You know, I, I read a book by a guy named who we call the Apostle of Prayer, named Andrew Murray. He wrote a lot of book on prayer. And he said that you have not really prayed on it. You, you took like 10, 15 minutes just to be quiet and still before the presence of God. And we live in a world that is fast and busy, where people do not take time to smell the roses, to look at. at uh, at, at the beautiful nature and look at the ocean. We are so busy, we don't have their face to face communication. We are busy texting, we are, we are busy what's happening. And so we are, we are losing the art of communication. We are losing the art of to really talk face to face. And sadly, you have entered in our spiritual life. We just come before God, busy, busy, and say some things and just rush off. And I believe the Holy Spirit is there with a broken heart, willing to say, My son, you have not. Prayed and I remember driving to work recently. I, I, I prayed and I, and, and I thought I prayed real good and fire up. And I was driving to go to work and I remember the Holy Spirit saying, Son, you think you have prayed and talked to me, but you have not really prayed. You didn't take time to listen. I wanted to direct you for this day. I wanted to tell you what to do. And sometimes it, it is said sometimes that if we take time to listen, um, Sometimes the answers that we're looking for, we can, if we listen at the point in which we're talking to him, we will be able to receive the answers then, rather than having to anticipate or look quite down the road for an answer, when God was willing to answer you there, but you were just too busy talking. Um, it, it is like, you would think about your relationship with someone, you're having a conversation with someone. And for instance, myself and you, I'm thinking we're having a conversation here. In this conversation, if I invite you to first have a conversation, and I said conversation, and for the whole hour that we spend here, if I do all the talking, then in some sense, you would feel that you have not really contributed towards this conversation. Because all you did, although listening is very important, but you did not have any input at all. You were just there as a silent listener. And I think it is necessary for us to understand that when we speak to him, he wants to talk to us. And we need to take time to listen what he is saying to us so that we can be guided, we can be led. And some of the answers that we might probably anticipate quite down the road, we can get right there if we take enough time to listen to him speaking to us. There's a belief that God created man, humanity, mankind, and then he withdrew himself 
from a distance. And I think there was a song by Beth Midler, from a distance, God is watching us. So there is a belief, I can't remember the name right now, where many believe that God created man, created humanity, created the world, and withdrew himself for men to deal with all of their problems, all of their situations. All right? That, that prayer, we ought not to pray because who are we praying for? God will not answer our prayer because he has given, he has, he withdraw himself and you know, allowing man to deal with all of their situations. So, so from a distance, they say that God is watching us. Yes. There's no direct interest from God now mm -hmm. for humanity and their crisis. So why pray? Why would this God speak? But that nothing could be further from the truth. Because right through the scripture, the Bible says, If you draw nigh unto me, and I will draw it yes. you. He said, Call unto me, and I will answer you. Yes. And show you great and mighty things which you do not know of. You understand? So God is always inviting us right through the scripture. When Israel would sin time and time again, time and time again, God will come after. He will send his prophets to give a word. To cause the nation to repent, to turn around. You know, he said, he said, he said a mother could forget you, mm -hmm. her, her babe, or suckling, yes. but I will not forget you. I will engrave you in the palm of my hand. God is a God of covenant, God is a God of relationship, and it has been humanity. It has been us. It has been the believer that are the ones that have broken the relationship always. It has never been God. Whether it's been Adam, whether it's been the children of Israel, whether it's been the New Testament saints, whether it's us now living in this time, we are the one that always break this relationship. So I want to say that God is a God that speaks. God is a God that hears. He's not a God from a distance, no. He's a God who wants to draw nigh unto us. He has not withdrawn himself, all right, and just watches us now to fix our problems because you know what? We can't fix our problems. This is beyond man. This, what we are facing now is be, beyond the, the um, medical science, beyond economic power. We need divine intervention. The church, we need revival. We need the presence of God. And I'm heading into a direction, if you just permit me. We have substituted many things for the presence of God in the church. Talents and gifts and music and song and dance and even our theology. And I'm all for theology. But sometimes we have all these gifts, and this generation, they said, is the most gifted and talented generation of church and believers the world may have ever seen. We could sing, we could dance, we could do all kinds of media, all, you name it, we have it. But the presence of God, we really lack that presence of God. Could it be that we have tried to substitute the presence, put the Holy Spirit aside, and try to replace Him with? With, with, with dogmas and creed and, and activities and we could be so busy busy doing stuff busy doing things and god is on the outside watching and say when you would you invite me you are busy you have activities but we're doing it without the presence of god the strength of our relationship really is where um, our life is supposed to flow from the, the strength of our relationship with God. Um, I, I go back to that verse of scripture where the Bible says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. It says, you cannot do that if you do not abide in me. And Jesus was really teaching us and showing us that if a man has to really be, uh, has to, let me use this term, if a man has to flourish, and blossom in life. If a man has to be the best that he or she can be, it has to flow out of their connection with God. And many times what has happened in the life of humans is that we seem to think that um, the more educated I am, or the more talented, as you said, and the more giftings and all of those things, and, we, and those things are very good, we need them. Sometimes we seem to think the more things that I have acquired, that is really going to speak to the strength of my life. But you know, one of the good things, um, COVID is bad, we don't like it, we don't appreciate what it's, you know, the um, discomfort it creates. But one of the things, because God has a way of allowing bad things to just work together for good. And one of the things that COVID is also um, affecting and has shown all of us that it doesn't matter if you're rich, you're poor, whatever status you have in this life, 
Um, COVID is no respect of persons, so it doesn't matter um, what status you have. You are always in a place where you need to realize, I need God. I need God for without God. And I think the world should, um, should be at that place right now where they should realize, look, all of us need God. And it is the relationship that we have with God that is going to take us through all of life experiences. And the strength of that relationship, as you were saying, comes from us taking time to spend with him. When we need to build and strengthen that relationship, it has to have a quality to it. It's not about, as you say, rushing in and rushing out. It's about taking time to spend with him. You know, I love what Jesus said about Martha and Mary. And, you know, why it was good for both of them to, to, to want to serve and make sure Jesus is treated well. But Jesus observed carefully, and he was speaking in a particular context, not that he did despise hospitality, but he was really saying that if you probably, um, if I'm going to make a choice in terms of what I believe is of the greatest value to a human being, it is the ability to sit by my feet and hear what I'm saying. And he says that Mary have chosen that part. While the others are so concerned about ensuring that I'm treated well, he says, but you know what? Mary chose to sit by my feet and hear. And that is valuable. This is very important. And I think that every believer, because we're talking about the believer and his relationship to God, every believer should understand the value of the relationship with God because every other aspect of our lives is going to flow out of that relationship. And if our relationship with God is bad, then it's going to be reflected in our relationship with those who are belonging to him, our brethren per se. What do you think, um, Brother Hannes? If our relationship with God is not right, it's bad, it's not good, will it affect our relationship with our brethren as such? Most, most definitely. In Exodus 20, I believe, when God gave the commandments, I think it just four, uh, about four commandments, commandments he did with our relationship with him. And then the rest of the commandments was our relation, relationship with one another. So yes, God wants us to have a, a very strong relationship with um, each other also. Flowing and, and, and coming out from our relationship with God. Because the Bible says, um, how can we say we love God whom we do not see? Yes. You understand? And, and we hate our brother who we see, who we meet daily in our lives. We see, we touch. And we, and we hate them and we, we, we claim to love, to love God who we cannot see. So we, we also um, to live in, in, in a practical, real way. But having a strong relationship with God. You see, what are the markers of a, a man or a believer that has a strong relationship with God? Is it being upon this pulpit? Because I tell you this, we measure maturity, sad to say some of us, by what we do on this sacred place called the pulpit. If I could preach, if I could lead worship, if I could sing a song, if I could dance, that is our, you know, in, in our mindset. To many of us, we think that that person is a mature person. But look at that person could pray. Look at that person could prophesy. Look at that word he preach. And we measure what takes place here. But in the eyes of Jesus, Jesus said, you prophesied my name, you, you did that and the other, yet depart from me, I never knew you. But a mark of a... a a, a, a believer in a relationship with God is change, being changed, being transformed into that image of Jesus Christ, allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And I'm saying that to get up to the point that once you are being changed and becoming more like Jesus because of that relationship with God, all of your life now will be full of love to, to your mankind, to your brother. Long-suffering, patience, especially to your wife, to, to, to your children. You know, you need some, some patience, why for your husband, vice versa. But that will uh, out of stem and flow, channel from a life that's in connection with God. Because you're going to get that patience, you get that, that, that loving kindness, that grace, that character is being formed in you now. To display, not only to God, but to display among the brethren, among the people that you're working, among the people in your community. You are being changed to affect the people around you to display a life. That's what Jesus said. You are light and you are salt. You're not being changed and transformed to go in some mount like a monk 
What effect, what, what good you are to humanity if you just want to go on some mount somewhere all by yourself? Because when the disciples saw the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, they had to go down the mountain and deal with a man who was demon possessed. They could not Peter onto the stair and build three tabernacles up there. But Jesus said, God said, No, this is my beloved son here. And they had to come down from the mountain to affect lives, to change lives. So we are. So much relationship, relationship with God affects how he relates to people, affects how he relates to his brethren. Um, Jesus has taught us some things. And he, I always say, is the prototype. Jesus is the exact, um, he's the example that we need to be looking at. And you would see him, how he would treat the brethren and how he related to them. Jesus was never one who carried, even when Judas, and Jesus knew that Judas was supposed to betray him. Yet, look at how he treated him. He did not treat him with um, you know, disdain or pushed him away. Jesus treated him with the same kind of love like all the other disciples. And so even while they were piercing him on his side, Jesus' words was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And my understanding from when you're connected to God, because if you look at Jesus' life, Jesus gave priority to his relationship with his Father. When he walked this earth, the Bible says he rose up a great while before day, and he went and he spent time with his father. And so he, after he came from spending time with his father, because he knew that if I have to be able to relate to people around me, I have to have a strong connection with my father. And so he spent time with his father, that's where he gave priority. And now he taught us that once you have that quality of relationship with your father, which as in the case of Jesus and us as Christians, when you have that quality of relationship with your father, it affects how you relate to your brethren in the church. So therefore, if a brethren or somebody in the church, and the thing is, Jesus, when he was, I want to touch on a subject here. Jesus says that offense indeed must come. One of the things that you realize that this it seems almost um, there's there's no way that we can avoid offenses from happening, and God sometimes may just allow offenses to come because offenses may have its benefits, and He says offense must come. But I'm amazed sometimes of how as Christians we respond to offenses because when I'm offended, Jesus could have been offended by Judas, but look at how He responded. Jesus could have been offended by those who were piercing him and placing crowns of thorns on his head. But look at how he responded. And we are called, therefore, to respond in like manner to our brethren. Offense will happen when you go to a church. I was listening to this, this clip not too long, at 98, and one of the leaders was sharing. You know, people, it's amazing sometimes how we deal with brethren and church pussy. Because... I can be offended on my job and I will still go to work. I can be offended sometimes even within my family and I will still stay there. But when I'm offended in the church, then I come to the place where uh, to that place where I said, I'm not going back there. Because that is my response to offense. I do not treat with it in the manner in which God expects me to treat with it. And if I'm dealing with offenses in that kind of bitter, unforgiving way, it doesn't question. Therefore, the quality of my relationship with God. I think so, Pastor, because um, as you rightly said, and you use Jesus as an example, how he uh, dealt with different situations, circumstances, the different attitudes of people. Now, once you are dealing with people, you will meet different point of view, experience different attitude, whether in the work and also in the church. We see that offense will come even among believers, among brethren. But sad to say, many at times we be, behave and we act just like the children of the world. But then we take offense, you know, and um, I think was, uh, this, this, this wonderful author and preacher, John Bevere, talk about in a book called The Bait of Satan. And he was really talking about the, the sin, or about offense, taking offense. Many take offense and, and walk out of church and never return. Many take offense and walk away from ministry. They used to be a Sunday school teacher. They used to preach the word. They used to lead worship. And they took offense because somebody opposed them. Somebody have a different point of view. And they were offended by that. And um, 
as you rightly say, we have to take the example from Jesus. We have to take the example from the Word of God. But the whole thing about offense is a real and is a critical thing. In fact, it, it, it's, it's a bait, it's a tool that uh, the enemy uses and the devil uses it in many instances to get believers to fall away, to walk away from church, walk away from ministry. But we need to take the mature approach to, to dealing with offense. And as you rightly said, it, it, it will stem, it will, it, it will flow from a, a mature relationship with Jesus, uh, with, with, with God and with Jesus Christ. It will take you to understand how the, the behavior of people, how people be, because not everybody, you may look at, at, at this chair and you may say, this is green. I may look at it and say, this is blue, this, this, this carpet, this different point of view. You understand? But I must not take offense, I must respect your, your opinion, hear your point, of this story and see if we could come to some other um, common ground. The Bible in, in the book of New Te um, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, there was that disagreement within um, within the the, um, the sharing of, 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 of the food to, um, to the widows and there was a dispute among the the women. You understand? And, and they came to the apostles and, and they set seven men full of the Holy Ghost, Philip and Stephen, those guys to deal with that. You know, so there was offenses, there was discord, there was there, there, there were challenges existing, and we will have challenges. You must believe us in your home, um, in your immediate family. You're going to have um, challenges, you're going to have disagreements. Offensive will come, and, it, and, and Jesus said it will come. It will, it must come. You're going to have offenses um, arising in the church among believers with leadership. You understand? You might want them to do go a certain way, and they might go a different way. What would you do? Would you walk away from church? Would you, would you backslide? No, 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 you have to take a different approach, you have to listen, you have to respect uh, uh, um, other people for you, you have to pray, you have to, you have to follow what the word of God is saying about the particular situation. And if we approach it from this mature point of view, I'm not saying we're not going to be heartbroken, I'm not saying you're, gonna, you're not going to run home and, and cry and wet your pillow because you have been disappointed, nobody listened to you, the um, offense came, they broke your heart. You understand? You had faith in them and they broke your heart. I'm not saying you're not going to cry. You understand? But you did deal with it in a mature way. It's interesting. Um, no, no, the relationship we have with God is one in which um, it, 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 it must have growth in it. So when you're connected to God, you're growing. And as you grow, as we were talking about offenses and so on, as you grow, maybe at the initial stage, you may deal with offense differently as against later on in your walk with God. Uh, you might treat with offense in a different way. Hopefully that is. But sometimes, unfortunately, um, we don't grow into those areas. Sometimes um, um, we learn to deal with offense in just one way. I, I walk away from you. I am bitter towards you. I am unforgiving towards you. And sometimes in my bitterness and my unforgiving attitude, I may now begin to um, say all kinds of stuff about you, back by do all kinds of things because, you know, human emotions now has taken over. And because emotions is, has taken over and flesh rules, you find that I am now not re I'm responding to a negative situation in the way I'm supposed to, as God expects me to. And I'm saying that the strength of a of a Christian relationship is going to be reflected in how they deal and relate to their brethren. Amen. If my relationship with God is strong, then the more I grow and strengthen my relationship with Christ, the least I will become easily offended and take certain approaches to dealing with negative experiences that I might suffer, even at the church experience. And we deal with some with church because it's church we're talking about and so on. And sometimes people seem to get the attitude when they talk church. They seem to think, well, you know, church is a place where only angels exist. But church is not a place where only angels exist. All of us are still what we call a work in progress. God is working on all of us. And while he's working on all of us, what's going to happen, at some point in time, we may not always get it right and we might offend someone in the process while we're growing. But all of us must be willing to grow and be willing to develop in such a manner where the, our connection with God, and that's why we were emphasizing very early that we need to take time to spend with God because you don't grow if you don't spend time with him and allow him to um, 
allow that relationship that you have with him to become developed and strong, uh, Brother Hannes. Of course, and I just want to reinforce this point. You know, how do we measure our growth again? How do we measure? How do we measure our growth? And as you rightly said, is it only when I believe is when these type of situations and things arise, offenses, and how we deal with it. These are good measuring sticks that how we can measure if we have grown from the time that we accepted Christ. But when you accepted Christ, you know, you, you maybe come out from a, a home environment that, um, that was, for example, rich, racial, treated a particular type of person, and have a certain mindset against them. You understand? And you would have come, come out from that environment. Yes. You're now safe, you know, a believer, but yet, you know, you will have that challenge, that battle in your mind towards that particular race of people. Right. But you cannot stay there as a believer. You have to grow and you have to, you have to love them. You know, love all race, whether it be African or Indian or white or, or Hispanic, whatever race, because that's what God commands us. Yes. Now, the love of God. So you cannot say that you're. Um, you're growing and still there's racialism, there's bitterness, there's unforgiveness in your life. And these are the things that really are the measuring sticks and rods that we should measure our real growth in our relationship with God. There's one aspect of preaching and prophecy which is all fine. You know, somebody, same preacher could, uh, could preach up a storm, you know, can be offended, can, can, can act in the flesh, you understand? But the more we, we grow in God, we become dead to these things. You know, dead, a, a dead man can hit. You understand? Because he's dead, a dead man can speak evil because he's dead. You understand? So, he's all becoming dead to the flesh. Alright? Mortify. You understand? To mortify the flesh, put to death. Alright? So, the more we spend time with God and the more we, our relationship is strengthened, our spirit man is strengthened. Our spirit man is become like a giant and the physical man, which is an enmity, the scripture says in the book of Romans, which is an enemy, enemy of God, dies and become less and less active. So if we are strong in God, our, our, our physical carnal man is put to death. So therefore we cannot respond to racialism. We, I know it's easier said than done, but we cannot respond to, to hatred and envy and, and jealousy and backbiting because a dead man cannot do these things. You understand? It's all about feeding your spirit. Right? With the word in the presence of God. And as you feed the spirit. That's why I'm going to use an example one day. I heard a preacher say that. He said uh, he had two dogs who will go and fight in a pit um, among other dogs. A black dog and a white dog. And he could say the day before that the black dog will win all the fight. And then the next week he said the white dog will win today. So a guy asked him, how do you know which dog will win the fight? He said, simple. The dog that I will win the fight, I feed him one, the next one wants to lose. I starve him. So the one who is starving, who is hungry and who is weak, will be defeated. But the, the dog that I feed him and strengthen and give the vitamins and water to drink and everything that is necessary, he will win the fight. And so it is in our lives. Who you feed, if you're into uh, carnality, pornography, if you're, if you're not praying, if you're into backbiting, if you're just in front of the television set, you don't want to read your Bible, you don't want to pray, and I want to be real, I'm, I'm a song harsh, you know, but I love you, that's why I'm talking harsh and strong, you understand? Who you feed will win, and who you starve will lose, you understand? So you can't say you want to know God and uh, in front of the television set, eight, nine hours with friends, four and five hours. And you want to spend that's about two minutes with God. You don't want to come to church where you meet the believers, where you hear the word of God. You must have an inclination, you must have a long one, you must have that desire in your life for the things of God if you're gonna grow. It's who you feed. You understand? It will be the champion in life. Who you feed it will cause you to be strong. And if you feed that spirit man in the things of the spirit, you will be a champion for God. There's nothing stopping you. It doesn't matter your race, your age, young people. If you sell out yourself with God, if you see God, He will blow your mind away. It has nothing to do with your age. It doesn't matter if you are a toddler. If you are 5, if you are 10, if you are 50, you may feel like it's over with you with God. You have fallen so many times away from God. You have broken the heart of God so many times. Today is a new day. You can start afresh. His arms is open unto you like the, like the prodigal son. You can come back. That father is standing. Today, the devil is speaking lies in your mind and say, you can't make it. God has forgotten about you. He doesn't care about you. There's a life on the pit of hell. You can start fresh with this God. 
You call upon him, he will show you great and mighty things. His arms is open unto you. It is never too late for God. If you, when you die, it's too late. But once you have the breath of life, you call upon this God. I'm talking from experience. I just experienced some glorious thing in the presence of God. Things that I was asking God, Pastor, believing God. And this is, God is so amazing. I believe and I'm seeking God and I'm watching God that way for you to come that direction, Pastor. You know, God come from behind. You understand? Sometimes when you're anticipating God to come one way and to answer your prayer one way, you come a different way, all to give Him glory and honor. What didn't expect? God come and, and, and brought super abundance to give Him glory and honor. This God is alive, He's a real God. Scientists say, you understand? There's this scientist, he died now, a great scientist that said, Man created God because of their weaknesses. Man and the church created God because of weakness. Because we want to run to a being that is superior to us, that is all powerful and all wise. Because we want to run to our God to help us with our problems, help us with our situations. We create this being and the church created this being called God because of our weakness. Hallelujah. But I want to say, when I'm weak, I'm strong in Christ. I thank God that I am weak. And this God that I serve, is not, a, is not in my imagination, He's real. And I didn't create Him. Pastor didn't create this God. The church didn't create this God. This God created us. That's He's right. real and most. I don't know what the matter the scientists say. They believe in science and, 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 and medicine and all these things. They want to push us God out of our lives, Pastor. In our world today. People, globalists, you understand? Scientists want to, philosophers want to push God out of us. Out That's of why we have these, these concepts now we call secular humanism. Yes. And we've gone in an area called relativism, um, saying all truth is relative, you know, as far as they're concerned. And so when they come to that area, talk about relativism. Um, you see that green? And I say it red, all of us right. And so it's, it's just a crazy world. But we, we, we don't want to run into <laughs> those areas there. Because we're talking about um, surrounded Christians so, so far. And we just want to talk about um, a man and his relationship to God. And rightly, on, on that note, as you come across there, talking about how scientists and all of these things saying, God, uh, we created that God because of our weakness. The thing is, I am thankful for this this morning. I'm praying right here. And I'm saying to God that, um, you know, I, I'm trying to use my own human imagination um, to try to, to, to say some things to God. I'm saying, God, if um, you only take one um, speck from your DNA, just one speck from a cell in your being, um, that, is, that alone is more powerful than all of me. And so to understand the vastness of this God that we serve, we don't have to create him, obviously. He, everything that we see, he created just by speaking and declaring, let there be. And the amazing thing is the great God that he is, he is the one that is seeking relationship with us. And he has been longing and looking and coming after us. I believe God has been pursuing us more than we have been pursuing him. And because he has been pursuing us, when we didn't even want him, he said, you know, um, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ still come and died. Some of us were probably cussing God, saying, we don't know God, we don't care, we're saying what we want. And he still was pursuing us with all of that. And came and the amazing thing is when you get to know him, that is really what makes the difference. But what we're saying tonight to you believers is that knowing God and establishing a relationship with him, um, is only that initial experience is only the beginning of what he wants to take us into because there is so much more that God will wants to bring us into and I like how earlier you bring out that understanding that we don't measure the growth of a believer by the gifts of the spirit you measure the growth of a believer more by the fruit of the spirit because the Bible says Jesus says by the fruit you will know them and not by the gifts because you know gifts can happen somebody can get saved today and manifest gifts and all kinds of stuff can happen in fact sometimes people have giftings even outside of the eternal experience and um, but the thing is um, fruits are not easy to produce 
Because when you talk about long suffering, kindness, meekness, we are called, Jesus says, now he teaches us this. And when you look at Matthew 5, the Beatitudes that we refer to it, you see he's saying that as you learn how to, 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 to connect with me, therefore you will be able to respond like me. So he's, I'm teaching you now, you must learn to love your enemies. You must learn to um, pray for those who hate you. You must learn how to um, love people even though they don't care about you and those who despise you. And he says, blessed are you when men shall persecute you and despise you and say, all manner of evil against you falsely. He says you are blessed. And so he taught us that we need to love people in spite of all that they will do. And to, in order to do that, we must be able to discover and find that the Bible tells us that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I can love people today, Brother Hannes, who hate me to the core. I can know you hate me. I can see you hate me. You can tell me you hate me, and I will still love you. And it doesn't matter. I don't want anything from you in return. All I need to know is that I love you, and I will love you freely and, and, and without any sense of anticipating anything. Because if I do not love you, I will not be manifesting the characteristic of Christ. And I need to show forth Christ like this as a believer. And so whatever response persons or people will give to you as a Christian, you are supposed to love them still. You're supposed to care for them. Jesus told us in his word, he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, with all your strength. And he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hence for the reason why if you are truly a believer, loving God and has a strong relationship with God, your relationship with God will teach you that you cannot hate your neighbor, will teach you that you cannot love, you cannot hate people rather, who looks different from you, will teach you that you should not have prejudice in your heart against another human being because you have a relationship with God. There is something called a conscience and the spirit of a man that will convict him if he's connected to God, that will tell him once you have fellowship with God, when you go before him, that's why we encourage you, spend time and talk with him. Because when you go before him, what he does, he brings stuff to you and tells you, um, for instance, my name is Caroline. If I go before him and, I, and he knows uh, somewhere in my heart that you know I have something against Brother Addison, God is going to bring that to me and say, um, listen, I love you, my son, but listen, I want you to fix that situation with your brother, Brother Addison. And so it's not good for me to just continue having fellowship because he tells me this. He says, if when I bring my gift to him, if I know that I have ought against a brother or a sister, he says, I need to leave my gift right there. Go and fix that situation with my brother and my sister and then come and offer my gift. Because if you try to give me that gift before, I cannot receive it. I will only receive it when I know you fix that situation between your brother and your sister. And so that's how he teaches us. When my relationship with God is right, it's going to translate into my relationship with my brethren and people around me, my neighbors, those who are idol worshippers, those who do all kinds of stuff, those who are in, involved in necromancy and all kinds of stuff they might be doing. Uh, some person sometimes will call you and they will say, um, I need prayer. Uh, so somebody, look, they throw something in my yard. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter what they throw in your yard. You will learn to relate to them and love them just as well. Because you understand that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Yes, Pastor, and you're so, so right. You know when Jesus said, um, Moses said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And then he said, but I say, love your enemies as you said, bless them that curse you and all these things. And um, not everybody will like you, Pastor. Yeah. There's some people on the job, you know, will talk to you real nice, laugh and talk. And there's some will pass you straight, hard, hardly have any communication. And you will wonder, you will look to yourself, what did I ever do? And you will look at yourself, you did not do that person anything they just there's some person just want to like you there's some person in your family there's persons in your community who not have like you matter of fact because you're a believer your light your, your light is shining they will hate you they will despise you but you have to um, still go and show the love of god in the book of james is a very practical book it talks a, a lot about our practical living 
what about loving about how you deal and treat with widows and the poor and your neighbors and all these kind of things. And you know, um, sometimes in writing my own um, community, there are people who not pass and give right, but I, I will give them right. I do not wait for the, the, to give the right, but I will give right. Whether you choose to give back or right or communicate with me or say hello to, uh, to me, I, that doesn't bother me, but I know I will do my part. Out of a heart that is genuine, genuine, sorry, out of a heart of love and affection, I say good morning. How are you? Give your right. Because um, I need to do what is right. Yes. How you respond, it's your decision. Yes, my decision is to follow the word of God. My decision is to express the love of God flowing out of my life. As Christians, that's what we are called to do. We live a life. Uh, we are I God, you know, this subject matter, I'm just really warming up here and finding, you know, so many and the, our time is almost gone. And um, I'm just really enjoying this conversation because there's so many, there are so many different things that we can talk about connected to God, how he affects every area of your life. When you're connected to God, your relationship with God affects how you relate to your wife, as you say, how you relate to your children, how you relate to the brethren of the church, how you relate to people, how you relate to the bosses and people on the job where you work. Your relationship with God affects every aspect of your life. And if you're a Christian and you know Jesus is serving him, and your relationship with God is not one that is really reflecting Christ like this, you need to check your relationship. You need to check the connection that you have with God. You need to go back to him and say, Lord, I don't think I'm doing it right. I need to get it right. Because you can't be a Christian and hate people. You can't be a Christian and still have bitterness towards people. You can't be a Christian and still have unforgiveness. It doesn't matter who it is. I always admire this preacher who is on air, um, Joyce Meyer. Uh, she would have gone through all kinds of stuff. And you name it, she talked about the abuses and the things that she went through. And still had what it takes to go back to her father and love him freely, even though he would have abused her growing up. And so there are a whole other stuff that we would have gone through. Like I always say to folks, you are not responsible for what happened to you. You didn't ask those things to happen to you. But you have a responsibility to know how you will respond. In fact, just last night in our Bible study, we were looking at Naomi and Ruth and those um, women who left um, um, Judah, went down to Moab, and they went there initially with a sense of joy. And, and uh, tragedy struck them while they were down there in Moab. All of them lose their husbands. Uh, um, Naomi lo lost her husband. Ruth lost her husband. Um, Oprah lost her husband. And every one of them are now coming back now to Judah empty-handed with nothing. And in those days, the women were so dependent on the men for sustenance. Um, they were dependent on those men. And they were now empty and coming back to uh, uh, Judah, as it will, Oprah would have departed by her, her mother-in-law asking her, please return to your family. But um, Ruth stayed with her. And the Bible tells that Ruth um, was very passionate in terms of her desire to stay with Naomi. When Naomi came back into her community, um, the women were saying, you know, calling her um, Naomi because Naomi means, um, um, you know, such a beautiful name. And, and, but, but when they call her Naomi, she says, don't call me Naomi. Please call me Mara because I am bitter. Because of the experiences that she go, went through. And sometimes you can go through things that can almost force you to become bitter. Joseph could have gone, um, been bitter with so many things. And so many persons in scripture could have been bitter with people. And you, your own self as a believer, could have been bitter with people. God didn't call us to be bitter. He called us to love people. And Jesus, as I said, is the greatest example. He taught me how to love people. While they were pissing his side, he was saying, forgive them. And he taught me how to love people, even those who hated him. The Bible says he came to his own and his own received him not. They didn't like him. They despised him. Scripture says he was despised. He was rejected. And they treated him badly. But he loved every single human being. And we are called to love people. When you get saved, you are not to walk in pride and hold your head high and look down on those who don't know Jesus and believe that in yourself you are better than them. You are called to reach out to them in love because Jesus taught us that we should love all men and love, as he said, just like we love ourselves. And so I want to encourage those of you who have been listening to us tonight. The walk with God is one when you enter into that relationship 
you are called to allow that relationship to so influence your entire life and so that it impacts you as you relate to people around you. Let the relationship that you have with God be reflected in how you treat your family, how you relate to people within the community, how you relate to persons on your job, how you relate to the brethren in the church that you go to. If you walk away from your church and say, I have nothing to do with those people, and you still believe that you're going to heaven, you need to put a question mark by that. Because I want you to understand that bitterness, unforgiving spirit, will not have no place with God. I want you to understand that you must learn to forgive, learn to love, learn to treat people and relate to people in the manner in which God expects you to. And he didn't ask you to look for love in return. All he asked you to do is to love them the way that he loves them. I want to encourage you tonight, if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus, he loves you, he cares for you. The preacher was just rightly saying to us just now, uh, your life can be so much more if you would only open up your heart to him. Just allow Jesus Christ to become Lord of your life. If you know him and you're walking with him, but your relationship with God is not strong, listen, take time to build a strong relationship with God. Everything else in this world, the Bible says, will perish. If you look at what is happening in the world, the Bible says the time will come when I will shake the heaven and the earth and everything around us is shaking. Economies are shaking. Uh, nations are shaking. Everything is reeling around us. Things are shaking and falling apart. And I can tell you, look carefully, man don't have the answer. The answer lies in one person, Jesus Christ alone. And I'm asking you tonight, give your life to Jesus. And you will know him. Listen, build a strong relationship with him because he's coming soon. Establish that kind of relationship where every single day you look forward to waking up with him. Thank you so much for listening to us tonight. We are from World Changers Assembly, situated at number 7, Flanders Street, Newlands Village Beach. And if you would want to ask questions in relation to that which we talked about tonight, feel free to call 786-0952. I'll be too glad to answer and respond to questions that you may have. If you want to begin a relationship with God, call that same number and other numbers that you would see on our page. And we'll be too glad to connect with you and help you develop a strong relationship with Jesus. Thank you again for joining us and have a great night, everyone. God bless you. Amen.